Back to today's video. Today is Monday, August 5th, 2024, and tomorrow, Vice President Kamala Harris is set to announce who she wants to choose as Vice President of the United States in the 2024 presidential election. Vice President Harris has saw, seen, overseen, a three-week long-standing veep stakes that has been going through a number of different cabinet officials, senators, governors, representatives, and mainstream Democrats across the United States in an effort to find the best-fitting candidate to run alongside Vice President Harris. Now, Kamala Harris has been pretty adamant over the past two weeks that this decision is really coming down to the wire. Many people had initially thought that this decision would be one and done and done in just a few days, one that could be done because of the big bench the Democrats have for this election cycle. But it became very clear that Kamala Harris was not only looking for just any vice president, but a specific type of vice president. Now today, narrowing down her choices, supposedly between Governor Tim Walz and Governor Josh Shapiro. Now, both of these candidates come from states in the Rust Belt region of the United States. In the uh, westmost tip of Pennsylvania and the eastmost tip of Minnesota, they get grouped in to these group of multiple states that typically vote all together, but in some circumstance, circumstances deviate from one another. For instance, back in 2016, Minnesota went to Hillary Clinton by 1.5%. In 2020, though, President Biden won the state by 7 points. Pennsylvania, on the other hand, went to Donald Trump in 2016 by 0.7%. In 2020, Joe Biden won the state by roughly one point. Now, I think what I find to be the most interesting about this entire process is that Kamala Harris didn't just extend this search to simply just the governors in the Midwest. It was very obvious from the beginning that we would likely narrow down to those states, but in the grand scheme of things, she looked elsewhere. She looked at people like Secretary Pete Buttigieg, who came from the state of Indiana and now Michigan, which is reasonably Rust Belt, but he wasn't a governor. He was a small state, uh, small city mayor uh, who also, you know, came into the presidential race with a lot of enthusiasm and backing on his side. That was really the extent of his, uh, you know, mainstream uh, personality and how the American public really knew him. She also looked at people like Senator Mark Kelly, Governor Roy Cooper, people who come from the Sun Belt, the, South, the southwestern region of the United States with Mark Kelly from the state of Arizona, uh, veteran, astronaut, very, very well-known guy in that southwestern region, and then Governor Roy Cooper, who comes from North Carolina. And so it really has gone very, very far. I mean, she cast a wide net and really pulled back some very, very strong contenders and arguably has narrowed in on the two strongest contenders that we have seen this entire election cycle. I made a video yesterday talking about a Tim Walls vice presidential pick because right now my bet would be on Tim Walls. I do think that he is the front runner right now in the Veep stakes, and I think that's been the way for quite that's been it has been this way for quite some time. I think Josh Shapiro had a very good strong start to this Veep stakes, but it has been made clear, abundantly clear, that the race has narrowed down to these two. And if I was to pick one over the other, I think Tim Walls right now would be the favorite in terms of uh, likelihood of Kamala Harris choosing him. And so Kamala Harris supposedly, again, this is all up in the air, has already chosen her VP nominee and just has yet to announce it. But obviously leaks happen and it has been a very, very tight five to six hours since that announcement has been made. So I'm not entirely sure that this VP decision has actually been made. And so Kamala Harris choosing her running mate uh, really will shake up this race, I think, in a very positive way. She has narrowed in again on two very strong candidates, especially given recent election history. To give you a bit of background, back in 2022... This was the race in which we saw uh, Josh Shapiro and Tim Walls run alongside each other in 2022. Now, Josh Shapiro had arguably a far more impressive uh, showing in winning Pennsylvania by 15 points statewide. In the state of Minnesota, however, we saw Tim Walls also win by roughly seven points statewide, a victory nonetheless. The margin here was narrower than it was for uh, Josh Shapiro. And to be fair, Tim Walz was facing stronger Republican candidates, an actual backing of the Minnesota GOP, and certainly a backing of the national GOP in an effort to oust him from the governorship. What we found here was that Tim Walz was facing a real contender, where Josh Shapiro certainly at one point in time may have been facing a candidate, Dog Mastriano, who did have the backing at initial glance, who very much fell out of the graces of the mainstream GOP and became far more extreme than what the party was willing to back. So they pulled out of the race, and Josh Shapiro won by 15. But in both instances, I think what this goes to show is that in 2022, we were working with a very, very Republican environment. Republicans won the national popular vote by three points nationwide. They flipped control of the House. And when I say a very, very Republican environment, I do believe Democrats did far better than they expected. But it wasn't a blue wave. And it certainly what it, what, wasn't, what, what, hmm, wasn't what it was back in 2020 when Democrats won a trifecta. 
we forget very quickly that Democrats won control of the House, won control of the Senate, and won the presidency back in 2020, the first Democratic trifecta of any year since 2008. And so 2020 to 2022, the bar was set quite high. But when Republicans are winning the national popular vote by three points, for any candidate, much less Tim Walz or Josh Shapiro, to be able to win in these states by margins that are reminiscent of 2020 or far, far, far outperforming what we saw in 2020. In this case would be Josh Shapiro's victory. It's not showing us here, but what we do know is that Joe Biden won Minnesota by seven. He won Pennsylvania by one. Minnesota going roughly even with where it was back in 2020, despite a six, seven, eight point shift nationally, is impressive. More impressive is Josh Shapiro's performance in the state of Pennsylvania. But context for the race absolutely matters. One was funded by the GOP, Minnesota, and one was not. In the grand scheme of things, though, both of these candidates are stellar nominees for vice president based on what we know about them. And so while I do think there's going to be undeniable baggage with both of these candidates, something that has been servicing recently with Governor Josh Shapiro or some of the op-eds that he wrote while he was in college, uh, some things, decisions that he made while attorney general, decisions he made in his administration while governor. For Governor Tim Walz, a recent DUI charge came out. Uh, I believe they said that he was speeding a 96 and a 55. Um, and so, you know, we really saw that some of these things that have been unearthed over the Veeb stakes have started to become more mainstream. But in the grand scheme of things, it very much seems like the Democratic campaign is willing to look past some of these issues, willing to look past some of these scandals and some of these things that are being brought up in the final stretch of this campaign uh, for the Veep stakes. And so that's what we're really waiting to see Kamala Harris decide to do, who she believes will offer the most electoral advantage to the Veep stakes. Right now, it looks like it's going to be either Tim Walls or Josh Shapiro. Again, my money right now is on Governor Tim Walls. But the impact of this cannot be understated. The Democratic Party is probably in the best point they have ever been this entire year on the national map here. Real Clear Politics shows Kamala Harris up in the lead for the first time ever this election cycle. To give you interesting context that I think really helps understand more and more about this race. When Joe Biden dropped out of the race, Donald Trump led him by three points nationwide, and Donald Trump was nearing 48% nationwide. Against Kamala Harris, he's down to just 46.8. On top of that, too, Kamala Harris completely wipes out Donald Trump's three-point advantage. Now, she takes the lead. The last time that Joe Biden led nationally... Never happened in the 2024 election year. Didn't even happen in the final months of 2023. The last time Biden was up was September 11th, 2023, when Biden led by 0.2. In just two weeks, Kamala Harris has taken what has been un impossible for Biden over the past year. She did it in two weeks and took the lead, according to Real Clear Politics. And so Kamala Harris now taking this advantage over former President Trump is only going to continue. I mean, we've seen an upward trend here. You can find that Donald Trump's numbers in the final, uh, sorry, in these early days of the campaign for Kamala Harris have really dwindled quite dramatically, as have his betting odds, as have his expectations, as have many people been looking at the race and saying, while Trump may have been a shoe in he certainly wasn't before. So Biden, again, was far outperforming, underperforming Kamala Harris. I mean, we can even see that the initial jump was over a point gained nationwide. And in a race that could be decided as narrow as the 2020 race was, this absolutely matters. 306 to 232 was really at Wisconsin, Georgia, and Arizona, deciding to go to Biden by 44,000 votes across these three states. If Biden had lost those states, Donald Trump would be president today and probably not running for re-election. But looking at the 2024 cycle, Kamala Harris and the Democratic campaign are very aware that they need everything that can help them to get across the finish line. And in some circumstances, candidates like Pete Buttigieg really couldn't do that. When you look at these states that are really narrow, Take a look. Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Georgia, Arizona. They talked about Mark Kelly. They talked about Roy Cooper, who comes from North Carolina. They talked about Josh Shapiro, who comes from Pennsylvania. In fact, they sent vetting paperwork to uh, P. Buttigieg, who comes from Indiana and Michigan now, Governor Gretchen Wimmer, who comes from Michigan. Uh, they sent vetting paperwork to Tim Walls from Minnesota, who's now in the final two. They made it clear, abundantly clear, that the Democratic Party would be targeting regions of this country that Kamala Harris needs to win. Why does that matter? When you take a look at how Democratic VPs were chosen in the past, it very rarely came down to the home state they were from. If you just look back at the recent history, we can see that Kamala Harris was chosen from the state of California. Biden ended up winning it by 30 points. Really didn't matter. In 2016, Tim Kaine was chosen from the state of Virginia. Sure, a swing state, but he wasn't chosen on the sole basis that those 13 electoral votes would go to Hillary Clinton. That was only 13 electoral votes. She had other options. Tim Kaine was chosen for options beyond those. When you take a look at 20, uh, 2008, who was chosen? 
Senator Joe Biden, the incumbent president from the state of Delaware, a solid Democratic state. When you take a look at John Kerry, he was the a, a presidential nominee. But when you take a look at who he chose and who Al Gore chose and who many other people chose in years past, sure, a level of regional advantage and a level of electability came with it. But in the grand scheme of things, Veep stakes never really relied on home state advantage up until recently. And now with Pennsylvania and Minnesota at the forefront of it all, I would say that Tim Walls, while he does come from a more solid Democratic state, comes with, in theory, less baggage and a little bit less of, uh, you know, pushback from members of the left wing. And I think Democrats are realizing that, you know, there's a reason when they look at some of these states why Democrats have been able to win. And I think they are trying to avoid any and all controversy as much as possible. In that circumstance, that brings them down to Josh Shapiro and Tim Walz. Obviously, I do think Kamala Harris could have chosen some other people and probably could still win the election with them. But this, again, speaks to this very, very honed-in strategy. The Democrats are not leaving anything to chance. When we look at the states they're focusing on in this swing state tour, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Arizona, Nevada, they just canceled Georgia because of the storm going on down there. They're focused and locked in on the six states now out of the total seven that make or break this election and initially focused on the seven. They made it clear their pathway to 270 lies through Pennsylvania, through Michigan, through Wisconsin. They're focused on the Rust Belt region as well. Again, thus the narrowing up to Josh Shapiro and Tim Walls. There are no bad options at this point. Both of them provide a lot to the presidential ticket, and Kamala Harris will likely be able to win with either of them. She's not guaranteed. Nobody is guaranteed. But she does far, far, far better than President Biden does in a head-to-head against Trump, especially with a new VP, even more for some voters to reasonably say, now I'm voting for Kamala Harris. Now I'm voting for the Democratic ticket. When you take a look at betting odds, they also agree. Tim Walls and Josh Shapiro are in a very narrow race. Let's see if any numbers have adjusted since I pulled up this screen. Over the past 90 days, though, it hasn't really been too much of a conversation because the market opened less than 90 days ago. But over the past seven days, let's take a look at this one. When you include Bashir and Cooper, there are periods of time where Tim Walls didn't even rank in the top two. In some cases, he was tied for third place, fourth place, really. Andy Bashir was up there, and Shapiro, for a while, has been everybody's fan favorite on the betting markets. Now, Mark Kelly had a brief stint where he was doing quite well. Today, he stands at a really low point in the Veep stakes, roughly three cents for a yes chair. It's very clear it's coming between Shapiro and Walls. But now, Walls takes the advantage for the first time in the entirety of the Veep stakes. That's fascinating. I think Tim Walls bringing this in too also might be swaying some of these numbers that we're seeing a bit of a decrease for Kamala Harris. Earlier today, it was 53 to 49, and now it's 52 to 51. When you take a look at the presidency, you can see that Republicans were at a low point of 49 yesterday. Democrats at a high point of 54. Republicans have slightly gone up. And I think the reason for that is because it no longer means, if Josh Shapiro is not picked, that 19 electoral votes from Pennsylvania are safe. Because if they are, again, she also very well could choose Josh Shapiro, in which I'd be eating my words here, because I'm not going to say we shouldn't talk about the impact of that. But if Josh Shapiro is in there, Democrats lock up the 19 electoral votes in that state, and it brings them to a whopping 251 electoral votes. What does that mean? It takes one more state, like Georgia, combined with, with, uh, with Wisconsin. Or another state, like Arizona, take away Wisconsin, and throw in Michigan, take away Georgia, you still reach 270. The pathway to 270 becomes a lot clearer with Josh Shapiro. But it's risky, because Josh Shapiro could turn off voters in states like Michigan, could lose it. Could turn off voters in states like Wisconsin. You could lose it. You could lose Georgia. You could lose North Carolina. You could lose Arizona. And with it, the election. With Tim Walls, maybe that doesn't happen. Or maybe it does. We really don't know. Right now, I have both of these contenders, though, giving her Wisconsin, giving her Michigan, but practically losing everywhere else, but not in a way that means that Kamala Harris can't win the presidency or won't win the presidency. Because those three swing states, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, could hand Kamala Harris the presidency if they wanted to. And right now, it looks like they're on track to do so. The new numbers look good for Kamala Harris. Momentum only continues with announcements like these. And tomorrow, or potentially tonight, we will find out exactly who Kamala Harris wants to run with and the impact of that on the entire election cycle. I'm excited to see it. We'll be watching. We'll be taking a close look to see who does Kamala Harris say, that is my guy. Because at the end of the day, this election has been so, so, so tumultuous, so fat, you know, rapidly changing. So much has happened in the span of just a few weeks. The presidential debate between Biden and Trump was just less than a month and a half ago. Isn't that insane? Here we are, August 5th. Tomorrow or tonight, Kamala Harris will choose her vice presidential nominee, and I am so excited to see who it is. 
So thank you guys so much for watching this video. Make sure to comment down suggestions below. Subscribe on the left if you haven't already and check out the Instagram and Twitter. At the top left of the screen, there's also a Discord server for you to go ahead and join. On the screen, there's a video you can watch and then a playlist for my 2024 presidential election analysis videos. Again, thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you all later, rather tomorrow.